Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Seeker Plus today. I am Trace, and this is episode one of three in our new series about holograms. Today, we're gonna talk about what a hologram is, who came up with the idea, what they're actually for, and why they matter. Make sure you subscribe so you get all the episodes in this series. But first, let's kick into it. Holograms are everywhere. They're in movies, they're in television, we see them all the time. Star Wars has the Death Star plans and the help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. And on Star Trek, there's the holodeck. We've got Marvel movies and they're everywhere in like every Marvel movie, even CSI has holograms in it. But holograms do seem to be, if you watch pop culture, the future of visual information display. But they're actually also the past of that. Holograms have been around way longer than you might think. So before we get too far into this, holograms, super visual, really stunning looking. This show, not so much that. That's totally fine. Use your imagination because all the holograms you've probably seen were computer animated anyway. Also, they don't look that great, you know, when you're watching a two-dimensional YouTube video. So, imagination circuits on. Etymology time, baby. Hologram comes from the word holography. It's two Greek words, hollow meaning whole or full, H-O-L-O, -O, and then graphy or grama meaning writing or document. Uh, you know, there are different translations, but essentially it's the whole picture, the full view, the full document. The term hologram was coined by Denis Gabor, a Hungarian physicist. Remember that name, because we're gonna come back to it in a minute. Gabor coined the term in 1947, but the hologram was sort of already around. He didn't create the first hologram. For that, you have to go back to 1886 and Gabriel Lippmann, a French physicist who really, really wanted to take color photographs. At the time, that wasn't a real big thing, so he had to figure out how to do it, and to do it, he used holography, holograms, but not quite like you think, because he used regular light, and he figured out the different wavelengths could be trapped in an emulsion it's complicated. Let's break it down. They were holograms, but not the way that you think. When you think of a hologram now, you probably think of that thing on your credit card or on your money, where you like kind of push it back and forth and you see the, the eagle and it looks like it's moving in there, right? Uh, but this is different. This is, if you move it back and forth, you see the different colors in the picture. He called it the Lippmann process. And basically he used the interference pattern of light to capture different wavelengths of information into a single photographic plate. And we're going to break that down in just a second. The pictures were color, sort of. It's complicated. Lippmann realized that color involves lots of wavelengths. So he used an emulsion that was sensitive to all the different visible colors and then painted that onto reflective mercury. Photography, by the way, has used linen, paper, glass, metal, all sorts of things to capture images. The thing is, the mercury reflected the light back through the emulsion. So it interfered with the light coming in. Think of two ripples on a pond. When they meet and they have a little point, that's called a standing wave, and that was inside of the emulsion so it could trap it in there at different depths for different wavelengths or colors. Holograms, you have to move to see the whole picture, and it's the same with this Lippmann process. All the colors were there, as natural as the day that they were made, with no dyes, no saturations, no chemical processes, but it took a long time, and you would have to move them around to see the full color image. But it was the first holographic picture. He actually captured a lot of these and published a paper on it in 1894, which won him, Gabriel Lippmann, the Nobel Prize. Dennis Gabor in the 1940s looked at the Lippmann process and thought, hmm, but hold that thought because I have to tell you about these socks that I'm wearing right now. They're awesome. They're called Bombas and they're the most comfortable socks in the history of feet with arch support systems that provide extra support where you need it most and a cushioned footbed that's reinforced for comfort without the added bulkiness. These Bombas feel like a hug around my foot. All of my other socks just don't seem good enough now. Go to bombas.com slash seeker, use the code seeker, and you'll get 20% off your first order of Bombas socks. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash seeker, code seeker. You get 20% off your first order. Okay, so back to holograms. The problem here is that the light from the sun is just too scattered. And that was how Lippmann had to make his photos using sunlight. So think of light kind of like sound. If you're in a room, say a concert, and the artist comes out on stage, everybody just starts shouting in every direction. It's, you know, some people are loud, some people are quiet, some people have high-pitched voices, some people have low-pitched voices. That is not unlike 
light coming out of a light bulb or the sun or a flashlight or whatever. It's just a big mess. But if you can be more precise with it, like a laser, you get a whole different thing, right? A laser would be more like a soloist or a choir singing together, perfect, exact. So Dennis Gabor took it a step further and went from sunlight to laser light. It wasn't just capturing color versus not color, but also capturing more of the image using the interference pattern. He did this by using something called a collinear background. Essentially, it's a, kind of like an accordion that's been expanded a little bit. And that collinear background reflected the waves, causing the light to interfere. The interference pattern, again, is like the ripples in a pond when they touch. You get that standing wave where they're meeting, and that standing wave can be captured inside of a photographic plate. So to do this, you need a laser, standard, a set of mirrors to reflect the laser toward the photographic plate, an object to image, say a hand or a tiny eagle. Then you shoot the lasers at the object. The object reflects that light, and it bounces toward the photographic plate. However, you split the laser from the source and shoot that right at the photographic plate to start. Once they meet inside that photograph, they create the standing wave. And if you capture it just right, you get the bounces off of the little eagle or off of my hand, and you get the laser that started the whole process. The idea being you've created more than just one light pointing one direction. Because lasers are so perfect and so in sync, the difference in all those little angles, all the little bounces of light off of the object you're imaging are caught inside of that plate. And when you turn the plate, you see the differences. As long as you put that collinear border back in between you and the photograph. Because by itself, the photograph contains too much information to understand if you just looked at it. So you have to put something in between you, but it does work, and then you see all the different sides of the image. Dennis Gabor was right. He figured out how to do this process, and he patented it in 1956, making the hologram a thing. Really cool idea. I think holograms are super intriguing because they're not unlike real life. You know that things have depth and are 3D because light reflects off things, bounces, and is perceived by your eyes from all sorts of different angles. When light finally gets to you, you're seeing all sorts of different things. Imagine if you couldn't move and you had to look at a statue. You couldn't see the other side, you couldn't see the back, you couldn't see anything, just the front. You're soaking in the light bouncing off of that statue, right? Doesn't seem very fun, but that's photography. Holography is being able to kind of peek around the edges. And that's what we do as humans all the time when we perceive the world. So that's why they're so intriguing. And when you see one, you get so excited about it. The thing is, we're still just talking about like still images and regular flat holograms. Could someday we make an actual 3D hologram? Could we make a moving image hologram? To find out more about that, you'll have to come back next week. And in the meantime, you can check out more Seeker Plus. Come find Seeker elsewhere on the interwebs as well. And you can also find me too. I'm at Trace Dominguez. And we'll see you next time on Seeker Plus.